Hello everybody, my name is Ray. Welcome to the Evangelical Dark Web. Today we will be um, suffering for Christ, and I say that jokingly, but we will be talking about Revoice, a conference specifically targeting Presbyterians to embrace homosexuality and transgenderism. And that's what Revoice is. And we're going to be watching one of their featured videos on their own YouTube channel. I believe this is from Revoice 2020. And this video has been making the rounds recently. I just thought I'd dive in and just expose what this ideology is all about. And just really show how um, people are trying to subvert biblical sexuality. So without further ado, let's start this nick and art hi friends nick and art i'm good with nick and art art and nick sounds better nick okay. And art. okay we're starting off by disagreeing so this is a good start yeah yeah mm. I like that. um well i'm art this is nick i'm nick um i'm gay i uh i'm celibate what was the last time i went on a date like four or five years ago um i'm 29 i'm a youth pastor in new jersey i'm nick i'm straight and i'm also a youth pastor in new jersey Wait, what? um you say he was straight yeah, we did a lot been of Q&A beforehand, so uh, if you missed that, I'm and really sorry. there's a lot of deep things discussed already. Uh, but so we wanted to start with telling you guys a little bit about the, the story of how we became friends, just to so have some context, um, kind of where, where we're at now. And so we're going to do that, then we're going to talk about some challenges in our friendship, and then we're going to wrap up by talking about some practices that, um, some practices and principles that we have that help us navigate friendship. Uh, and we hope you have a bunch of questions. Um, feel free to ask them in the chat, and then we'll, we'll do Q&A at the end. So we're really excited about that. Um, but I'll start by telling you a little bit about the story. We're going to interrupt each other a lot, so just um, be expecting that. But we met in college. My last semester at our college was Nick's first semester. We went to a school called Nyack, tiny little Christian school outside of New York City. Um, so I was a senior, and Nick was a sophomore transferring in. And I was really intentional about getting to know the younger guys in the youth ministry department at our school. We both studied youth ministry. Setting a custom and speed. There, there's this thing that would happen sometimes where I, I was always praying for God to show me like who to invest in. And sometimes I would meet someone and God would just give me like deep, deep, deep love for them. And we happened what? to have that happen when we met. Um, I met Nick because we were hosting a bunch of the younger guys in the department in our dorm and Nick showed up and instantly I was like, oh, I love this person and I'm supposed to like have a friendship with them. And what? I felt really called to him, but it was pretty one-sided for a while. Nick wasn't really looking for strong friendships. He spent a lot of time with his girlfriend. He spent a lot of time off campus, but we both enjoyed time together. Um, but there was some ebb and flow. So I'm like, oftentimes people meet me and they, they like trust me, which is really cool and really helpful in ministry, but has created some weird dynamics. So like really normal situation in college was like, I make tea for someone, they cry within an hour of meeting me. And like, it just, it can be pretty intense. So that happened with Nick. He comes over for tea, ends up sharing way more than he planned. And then like, don't hear from Nick for like two or three weeks. I'm like texting him like, Hey man, let's hang out sometime. Um, it was like, I was, I was definitely... Is he talking about grooming someone in a youth ministry? So, disclaimer, I saw clips of this. I have not seen this all the way through, but I imagine that there would be talk... Like, I saw clips that made it sound like he was grooming people, but I did not realize that those two met as a result of him grooming. Uh, like, I was... Remember, I was coming in as a... Uh, like, in the spring semester, and so... It was kind of hard for me to find people to uh, like get involved with. And so I kind of let life happen to me a little bit. I was a little bit unintentional, but like there was more at play than just unintentionality for me. There was kind of this like outpouring of like we'd, we'd grab tea or grab a meal and then like uh, that thing would happen and you would pull all this stuff out of me. And then like, what? I'd feel like, what oh, is he I, pulling I can't out of do him? this again. And like, uh, there was kind of this ebb and flow of like experiencing that vulnerability and then like being afraid of that uh and so like that would happen somewhat frequently where i would like i would just kind of disengage and so that was kind of my own stuff i was wrestling with at that time yeah so i, I graduated like four months after we met each other but we lived near each other in jersey so we kept some of our rhythms we'd still meet up for lunch like about like every two weeks um we, we, had, we had a lot of chipotle in those days and uh we talked a lot about pretty much everything like jesus friendships relationships uh his girlfriend we would talk about everything and I started working my, my first youth ministry job. So I, I got really busy and he was still in college. So it took a lot more work to be friends than it did in college, which is like a big part of having a job and being in the workforce. And I started noticing that I was doing a lot of the heavy lifting. So this would, this would be the case for the next three years, he was still in school. 
and I was working full time. But I, there was this like imbalance. I would I would be driving out to him. I'd be checking in on him, um, things like that. And I think like um, so, I, I mentioned like there was this lack of desire to experience the emotional discomfort of just like putting myself out there vulnerably. But uh, one of the other things I was wrestling with in in that time was like I kind of grew up with the message that like, if you're talking about your friendship, then like there's, there's something wrong. Or like, if you're talking about your friendship, you're trying too hard. And so um, I just kind of wanted it to be what it was. There was kind of the unintentionality there, but like, I think uh, I was, I was experiencing the discomfort of just talking about the, the friendship in general. And like, that's one of the things we'll talk about in a little bit, but um, in that moment, I'm kind of going like, like, why do we need, why does this need to be so hard? Why do we need to like, why do we need to talk about this? Why do we need to be intentional about this instead of just let it be what it is? Yeah, we, we had a, a pretty, in, at this point, infamous, if you heard my revoice talk, you heard me talk about a conversation that Nick and I had in the car. Not a good day for Nick. And uh, I drove up to school because there was like this tension in our relationship and I was feeling like, like I was doing a lot of heavy lifting, like I said, and like he would call me like having a bad day. You would like be fighting with your girlfriend and you'd like call me in the middle of the night, like driving her. But then like I would need something and Nick was like nowhere to be seen. So I, I drove up to have this conversation with him and I was like, dude, like, I, I see you as a really close friend. Like to me, you're like an extension of my family. And finally, Nick turns to me and he goes, I, I like you and like we're friends and we're buddies, but we're, let's just be buddies. Like I don't have room for like any, you know, he's like, you know, he has, he has three siblings. He's like, I have my parents, I have my three siblings, I have a girlfriend. I don't really have room for like a really intense friendship. And that hurt because, you know, I'm, I'm an only child. My dad had passed away. So it was just me and my mom. And so I'm going, well, I do have room. And also I, I really care about you. And Specifically at that time, there was moments where like, there was a lot of hurt in that friendship. And this one, like, we have to be really prayerful. There was a lot of hurt. And there were moments where I was like, dude, I'm so done being friends with this guy. But I felt like God kept like calling me into this friendship. So we have this conversation that's really hurtful. And I felt like, okay, he doesn't have room to be a better friend to me. And that's okay. Like he's been honest about that and I can't force him. So I can just meet him where he is um, and we'll we'll keep being friends, but I'll, maybe I'll sort it down a bit. And uh, I can't expect, like, even if, I, even if I'm going to give, I can't expect at any other level, and that's okay. So things went on like that for a while, and Nick, like, slowly started being more intentional. He started realizing he's, like, he, like, wanted better friendships. Um, and we, we had, like, this friend group that, that all yeah. of us. Like, one of the really important things here for me was that I, it wasn't that I, like, in that moment, I said I didn't have the room. But, like, I think what's really important is I didn't make the room because I didn't value friendship the way that, like, now at this point like we both really believe that having that sort of friendship is like really good and like healthy for all of us and so uh like what was really important for me and as that started becoming more frequent what's going on on in my mind is like it's not that i didn't have room it's that i didn't make the room for that and and that became more intentional as we went on but sorry to interrupt you no you're good um so as it became more intentional i was kind of having a hard time receiving that because it was like dude i've tried to rely on you in the past didn't work and then he goes through this breakup and all of a sudden he's really available and he wants me around. He wants to come spend the night at my place. He wants to talk more. And every single like side B or side that person has had this happen where like your friends in a romantic relationship has no time for you. And then they break up and all of a sudden they're like, hey, bestie. So I was, I was really defensive about it and it was really hard to trust him. But also we were the only single guys in our friend group at the time. So we were spending a lot of time together because like oftentimes I don't want to hang out with my other friends, but they were just busy. So by default, almost, we were spending more time together than we normally might. It was fun. It was a good time. But I was kind of feeling like, okay, as, as soon as some girl comes in, I'm just going to get dropped again, right? Uh, but we started getting dinner almost weekly, and he, he worked south of me but lived north. And so I would meet him halfway through his drive home, and we would have dinner. Like every week we would do that. And um, there's there started to be a lot more connection and trust because we were seeing each other a lot. And then we had this weird moment. Why is he, he wearing a wedding ring? I had no clue. But we're out to dinner with a friend and he's like, oh yeah, I'm moving in a month. Which I was like, what? It's like, how did I not, how did this not come up before? And I'm reeling because he's going to move closer to his job. He's not going to have this commute. And so I'm going, oh, cool. We're not going to see each other anymore. Because I was meeting him on his drive home. And he could tell something was bothering me. So after our friend left, he asked him like, what's going on? And I didn't want to say anything, but I, I was like, listen, I've really enjoyed doing this every week. And, I, and I'm sad that now that's not going to happen anymore. And I think like, for me that in that moment i'm that that unintentionality also like it almost became like this assumption that we're just like at that point we were hanging out a lot more and we were intentional about those rhythms so, so like for me as a person just like uh like we like i uh 
Yeah, I YouTube's really, testing once, this thing where the they're going to get rid of the like, dislike once, button. You know, this is true. That's why it's I imagine like, Revoice will once a rhythm is ingrained in my life, get rid of the dislike like, option there, button and so, if like, they have the chance. For me as a person, I don't know if this works for everybody, but like, so that move for me, I was like, dude, of course we're still going to be hanging out. It's like, but it, it wasn't a given. It, it, it was something that I had shown in the past. Like, if it's not convenient or if it, if I don't have room for it, like, it's just going to go and, um, but so for me, like I've needed to be more expressive about that, even though like I've been taught not to. But it, I mean, it became a given, right? So we, we, he moved to this apartment almost an hour away. We still saw each other once a week, pretty much. So either we'd meet halfway for dinner or I'd go spend the night at his place or he'd come drive out and spend the night at my place. And around this time, I started realizing I was gay and had been in denial for a number of years. So I started having like a life crisis and Nick's my most consistent friend. So I'm like showing up to his place, just crying most weeks, like Thursdays, like we, we both have Fridays off. So I'd show up Thursday night, we're both fired from a long week and I'm sitting there processing being gay, processing the potential of celibacy, being closeted in a youth ministry job and just like ugly crying on his couch pretty much every Thursday. It was, it was rough, but he was really supportive and really helped me navigate sexuality and uh, read books with me and would like read articles. And as I started thinking about celibacy and I, I read Spiritual Friendship by Wesley Hill, which destroyed me, there was this like other turning point in our friend group because Wes was talking about like finding family structures. And I, I said to my friends, cause we all kind of like loosely referred to each other as brothers. I said, I need you guys to stop calling me your brother. Because like, if you just mean it, like the old guy at my church is like, good morning, brother on Sunday morning. Like I, you can't call me your brother. Cause like, I need to know if I have a family. So call me your brother. If you mean exactly the same thing you mean with your blood, blood siblings, but if you don't, then that's okay. We're friends. And that's great. I just need to know. And that was a big turning point. Cause the guys all kind of were like, I guess we are family. Yeah, I think what? so like for me in that moment, I'm, I really took that to heart, especially even like you coming and staying over and like seeing a lot of like, whether it's just pain, uh, like of like pain that you ex experienced as you're wrestling through celibacy or sexuality or uh, like those, those conversations, um, like Thursday nights where you'd come to my apartment crying and like those, like I'd see the pain that you'd experience or just the weight that you'd experience of that. And uh, like, so in that moment, it like I really took that to heart and uh, like I've other moments like that I've really needed to wrestle through like is that something I'm willing to do and, and for us that that is what it is and like I've in those seasons and, and like they, they still come up ebb and flow right but like I definitely like those are seasons that God really planted seeds to uh, do a little bit of what we're doing now like that like that we are walking together simultaneously whether it's with your celibacy or with my situation, if that's a marriage one day, um, like we walk alongside each other in that. And that's something what? that we committed to in that moment. Two guys uh, going down the aisle. Too, so. Yeah. And so over the next like two years, or I guess from there, like three or four years, um, it started developing to where we realized, okay, we're family. What's that mean? And Nick started feeling more and more called. Like, I remember this one day specifically, I was like crying about the weight of celibacy, like coming home from work and having no one to like sit down with after a long day at work. And I got in like attacked at work that day. It was just the worst. And I just had no one. And Nick calling me and I'm like crying. And I remember you going like, well, it's it's really important to me that you wouldn't just come home to no one every day. And I'm like, well, that's great. But like, what does that mean, right? Um, so over the past two years, two years we've developed uh, kind of our vision for what life's gonna look like. And, and this friendship's become, um, what became a family and then became a household. So um, it's been a lot of time together and a lot of hard conversations, uh, but we moved in together 10 days ago, 10 days ago. Um, which by the way, if you struggle with insecurity, a two-year lease is such a great way to lock someone in. Highly recommend like a legal contract and his security deposits in my name. So like I got his money, he's, he's staying like he's, he's mine, but we, we consider each other brothers. We're deeply committed to each other, uh, which has taken me some while to trust that, but it's really cool that now I can, uh, but we're planning on sharing life together for the rest of our lives, which we're not totally sure what that looks like. Obviously Nick is straight and he does plan on getting married but we're totally committed to finding a way to, to live together and function as a household. And there's what? different ideas of what that looks like, right? There's a lot of details we don't know. Do I, you know, live in a house with them or do I live next door? My, my dream world is to have a hobbit hole out back, like an actual hobbit hole. And I just like go retreat to my hobbit hole every day. Um, also, I don't want to live with screaming kids. So that sounds awesome. But uh, no offense to anyone with kids. Kids are a blessing from the Lord, just not for the celibate man. That's so, like the one good um, thing he said. You know, but we... We've got a few things worked out, which is that we don't move without each other. Um, if he moves, I move. If I move, he moves. And uh, we make decisions together as a family. Uh, whatever, like big, like if we get a, if I get a job someplace and that means uh, a change of location, that's a decision we make as a family. 
Uh, when he has a wife, one day, she'll make those decisions with us. And Does that look like the face of someone who's like. enthusiastic about hearing but us? Obviously, there's a lot of challenges to that. Um, so that's where we're at right now. We're going to talk about some of the challenges that have come up in our relationship that honestly, mostly still come up sometimes. So let's just stop right there. So he's talking about, you know, he's so dependent on this friendship that he's going to spend the rest of his life trying to live with someone that he's obviously in love with that is not in love with him back, but still values the friendship, I think, or at least the money that comes with it for sure. What woman in their right mind would sign up to marry him with that guy attached in a package deal? I, I can't think of a single woman that would be interested in that package deal. And, you know, I, I know people who've been married. You don't want, you need your space. You can't be living with a uh, third wheel all the time. That's not cool. What is he supposed to do? Um, and the first one's like the first thing everyone asks me about when they know that uh, I'm, I'm gay and he's straight and we have this friendship. And also he's really cute, right? Like he's, he's a total cutie. No, I'm not at that. You're so <laughs> okay. Uh, but the, the classic question I get asked is, you know, is it weird to be attracted to him sometimes? Which it's totally been weird. And uh, it's been more than weird at times. Like it's been a real barrier in our relationship. And um, I would say that's been one of the biggest challenges for me is that, you know, I think there is some attraction here and uh, there's definitely like physical and romantic feelings at times. And I'm going to break those down because I feel like they impact our relationship really differently. The, the physical attraction, I mean, I come from the ex-gay world, right? So like a lot of times in the ex-gay movement, they teach you if, if you start being attracted to a guy, you need to get away from that relationship because it's going to tempt you. And so when I started having, like, I would start realizing like, oh, Nick's cute. And then I would shame spiral instantly because I'm going, oh man, I have to get away from this friendship. Like it's not good for my spiritual health, but all the evidence was otherwise, right? That it was really good for my spiritual health. We've like, I've never prayed with anyone as much as I pray with this guy. And the conversations we have are just so incredible. There's so much accountability and love and support and has been for even like in seasons where he wasn't the best friend, he was still incredible and championing me, championing me. Um, and so I was realizing, okay, like this is really good. Like I know Jesus so much more because of our friendship, but also like he's cute. And there's the side X training going like, get out of there. But there's also my shame, right? Like my internalized homophobia. Every time I'm in a coffee shop and I think the guy's cute, instantly shame spiral, right? Like this is, I'm disgusting. I'm so gross. So it started to create a resentment in me because Nick's cute, Nick's attractive. And then I would see Nick and I, I, would, I would be hanging out and there would be a moment where I would feel like, you know, an attraction towards him or I would notice he was, he was good looking or something. And then I would feel shame. So being around Nick got to a point where it, like being around him made me feel shameful. And I started like not wanting to be around him and I would try to get away from him. And so it, like that attraction, the physical attraction um, has really created shame at times. It's created distance. It makes me not want to be, I've had to call people and be like, I, I think I can't be friends with him anymore. This is a lot. And I've, I've had to work through just a lot of that internalized homophobia, honestly. And just like, it's not a real thing. Being able to separate like, okay, where's their lust in my life? And where's their just like plain old, like, oh yeah, he's a cute dude, you know? And having to do that work sometimes with like other queer friends or side B friends who can like work through that with me. We've had to have conversations that are uncomfortable for me at times. Um, and I'm sure they've been uncomfortable for you at times. Nick, Nick is really dedicated at this point to having almost any conversation and we're really honest with each other. So it can get really weird. Um, I'm sure. But for there to be room in our friendship for the fact that I experienced that and like, I'm, I'm obviously like, there's moments where I'm terrified of him finding out who we used to be, right? Like when I first started realizing this, I'd be like, oh my gosh, if he ever knows, that's it. I'm going to lose my best friend. Obviously I haven't lost my best friend and we can talk about it really casually. Um, I think the romantic feelings can be more complicated now, now that I've dealt, dealt with a lot of the internalized homophobia and I, I know how to wrestle through like attraction and lust and whatever. Because uh, there's this fear of like falling in love. Um, actually, um, we didn't remember what birthday it was. There was one of his birthdays where we're at the dinner and I was being weird. And it was like early into me being celibate. And he was like, what's going on? I'm like, it's your birthday. We don't got to talk about it. He's like, well, it's my birthday and I want to talk about it. And I said, okay, so what happens if I fall in love with you? And we're like in the middle of a restaurant. And it was really awkward. Uh, and he just looked at me and said, well, we're, we're brothers and we'll figure it out. And that meant the world that that's where he stood. 
but for me, there's like so much fear, fear because like we're extremely close. We share pretty much everything. There's lots of intimacy in our relationship, but I'm still a celibate guy and I don't have romantic intimacy in my life. And it makes me scared that it'll be painful to watch him get married. You know, it makes me scared that it'll be painful to, to experience that or to sometimes desire a sort of closeness with him that I can't have, but also that he doesn't want. And that's a weird part of it too, is there's moments where I'm tempted to like feel less loved than I actually am. Because this is not a healthy relationship whatsoever. You know, uh, Nick over there is being held back basically by having a, a homosexual roommate who wants to identify as a celibate Christian or a celibate gay Christian, I should say. And then Art over here is basically trying to legitimize um, this woke ideology in his own life. And he's trying to distinguish between same-sex attraction and homosexuality. He's trying to say that um, that the attraction is not a sin and he shouldn't feel ashamed of it. And, you know, as long as he's not having sex with dudes, you know, he's fine. But, you know, that's not, that's not real repentance. He's basically trying to say, you know, how close to the line can I get without, or how close to the fire can I get without getting burned? That's basically his mentality. Because he doesn't necessarily love me with any, like, he doesn't have those, like, muddy, weird romantic feelings intertwined with the friendship, right? He just, like, loves me so much as his friend and his brother. And so sometimes I convince myself that because he doesn't love me the same way, he doesn't love me as much as I love him. And that's just not true. Um, so that's been one of the challenges is that attraction. And the next challenge is just we have really different personalities. Um, anyone who knows us, we're totally opposite. Love that little type. He's introverted. Of, yeah. I mean, heavily introverted. I'm heavily extroverted. Uh, we show love and affection really differently. I'm very touchy. He's very nice. A lot more these days. But I mean, when we first met, like getting a hug from Nick was like, I mean, it was winning a Nobel Peace Prize. It meant a lot. Like it was a big deal. Um, but I, I felt unloved sometimes because he just shows love differently. You know, and he shows affection really differently than I Is do. Is he really breaking down into so love like, languages I all day and with a friendship? Does not want to do either of those things. How we rest in vacation, you know, how we how we deal with food, like food's a whole thing sometimes. And so there's like so much difference, and we're constantly trying to meet halfway, and we're constantly trying to work things out. But, so, yeah, like some of the ways, I, the way I like the, I don't think this is just a positive spin on it, but like um, I really do think that. Like, again, if we really believe that this is this friendship is something that God has put in both of our lives for for our good and for uh, like his best for both of us, then like those same things, like when, when it's personality stuff or like whether I'm introverted or you're extroverted, like we both express a lot of different ways that those have been so uh, like sharpening for us. And like we we are so drastically different. And because of that, like we learn from each other so much and like that is why these types of friendships are so important. Like not just gay and straight, but like, uh, like introverted and extrovert. Like we specifically learn so much from each other because of our, our differences. And like, I love that about our friendship. So. Yeah. We, we just moved in 10 days ago and I was telling him like, this is the most restful I've felt the whole pandemic because he's just such a slower paced person than I am. And it forces me to just be at a slower pace when I'm home. And it's been amazing. Like it's just been so good for my heart. And so there's ways that's amazing. There's also times when we're on vacation and I'm like, okay, pick it up. Like there's a mountain to climb, there's things to do, you know? So it, it can be a challenge. Yeah. And so I'll just share one of the challenges that, that there's been for me. Like, I think this one's really important that um, you touched on it a little bit before, but the, like the different possibilities that I need to wrestle through when I experience dis discomfort. Uh, like if I experience discomfort in our, in our friendship, a lot of times, like for, for me as a straight person, it's been, it's been so easy. And like, it, it really is kind of set up in a way that it's easy for me to go, well, I'm uncomfortable. So you need to change because like, uh, because I'm in the majority. So I'm able to go like, yeah, you, you're making me uncomfortable. So you need to, you need to change or, or do something. Is he about to invoke like, critical theory uh, that he's the, the oppressor? I think it's a, a good thing to do, but like, it's definitely, it requires more effort. And that's why I think we don't do it often that like, um, there's different possibilities for the reasons that like I'm uncomfortable in a, mo in a moment. And like, so maybe I'm uncomfortable for, because of a good and healthy boundary, but maybe there's homophobia or like perception issues or intimacy issues that I've just grown up with or like, 
or maybe it really is like a healthy boundary that I have, but uh, like, so that, that question, like, why is this making me uncomfortable in, instead of just the assumption that, well, I'm uncomfortable. So you need to change. Like, uh, like I've needed to take a step back and go, hold on a second, just because I'm uncomfortable doesn't mean you're wrong. It doesn't mean like it, it mean like at least at the very least I need to go, hold on a second. Why am I uncomfortable here? Because not only is there, yeah, like the, uh, like discomfort of like, whether it's homophobia or things like that, but even like Brazilian culture is a lot more touchy than, uh, like I, I don't like physical touch as much as he does for lots of different reasons. Almost no one likes physical touch as much as I do. <laughs> but like, I it. so that's one that's actually come up a decent amount where it's like, okay, why am I uncomfortable here? Because there's, is, is it a cultural thing? Is it because like in Brazilian culture, it's typically uh, more, more touchy in that way. Or like, uh, am I uncomfortable because of my own homophobia or am I uncomfortable because I'm in, in public and other people are going to see that. And I'm not sure whether people will receive that like we're romantic and like, is that wrong or is, is that homophobia? Cause it could be, it could be homophobia that I'm experiencing that perception thing that way. But it also could be like something we both really talked about is like, uh, like, and I've said this already today, but like, I really believe that what we have is God's best for both of us. It's okay. Paul's right there. So basically what he's saying, and I'm going to equate it to race you know, he's saying that, you know, you can't be, you know, if you were to apply this to race, because this is critical theory that he's articulating in some way, shape, or form. And basically, if a, you know, say that he was, that Nick was white and Art was black, he would basically, he's basically saying that, you know, if I'm uncomfortable in a friendship, a lot of times it could be because I have internalized racism and stuff like that. Like, you know, he's, you know, he's fighting off his own racism. And that's the same dynamic that he's talking about here. So now he's going to say that this unhealthy friendship is God's plan. So, uh, like, if, if it's not being perceived as what it actually is, like, I believe that this is something that's really good and, and other people could experience too. And so if it's perceived as something else, then, like, that good can't be expressed. And so, um, yeah, I, I think that that one's one that's really, really come up for me. But, um, yeah. Yeah, and I think what's what's been challenging about that one is that, like, there's shame there for me, right? Like, if Nick goes, hey, I'm uncomfortable, I'm instantly going, oh, no, I'm, like, my gayness is affecting our friendship. Like, that, and that, I, I say that all the time, like, oh, man, it'd be so much easier if, like, if I wasn't queer, right? Like, our friendship would be so much simpler. But and that's the moments that I go, like, that's where it's really important for me to go, hold on a second. No, it's not. That is not what, like, he, like I need to step back and go, yeah, I, why is this making me uncomfortable? Because there's a lot of different reasons that it could be. Um, were you gonna say something? Yeah, else? yeah, and like, there, like there have been times where we've gone back and realized, like, oh, actually, like Nick was responding out of like an unhealthy like defensiveness, or like it was a perception thing, right? Or there was like homophobia in in play with it. Um, and like one of the things that like heteronormativity and homophobia have like a really rigid outline of male affection. So like, especially in America, right? Like men in America have like a very specific box for what they're supposed to look like in male friendship. Uh, whereas if you go to other cultures, it just does not look like that. Brazilian men are way more touchy, even though Brazil has its own like machismo. And so like, there's just like not that many options for men to be affectionate in America, but like, it's been really important for me to go, hey, that might be your discomfort, but like, we can't act like that's a biblical ideal. Because a lot of times in the church that gets intertwined, right? Like comfort and culture and biblical doctrine can become like one thing when they're not. And like, we see men in scripture being very affectionate with each other. And like, John is resting his head on Jesus' bosom at the Last Supper. And like, David and Jonathan's re relationship and friendship is extremely intimate. And sometimes I have to go, hey, that's like, if that's your healthy boundary, that's okay. We can't think that that's like what scripture says. None of those people were you know, like, gay. Is, is there something else here that scripture is calling us to that we have to at least do the work of exploring? And sometimes there is. And we found that there, there often is, right? That, that often what I'm taking as my fault, and he's instinctively going, well, maybe it's not often we go, oh, wait, it's the culture around us has taught us that there's no way to have a thriving friendship and, like, affection and intimacy, but scripture says otherwise. Yeah, I think, like, so all of this, say, like, these are, these challenges, they can be a lot, it's, it's why a lot of us run from friendships, especially more intimate friendships than are uh, maybe culturally acceptable or, or maybe that we're used to, but uh, and I think, like, even as we've been talking, I'm like, oh, I hear a lot of these, these principles as, like, these practices that we're going to talk about are things that like you'll even as you as you hear them you'll go back to the story we shared and go like oh i see where that was uh because i know i did just now but the first one 
uh, and I, this one, like mainly my weakness, we need to just get comfortable talking about friendships in general, like, and, and talking about our friendship with our friends. I told you guys at the beginning, like, I totally grew up just like, if you're talking about it, you're trying too hard, that kind of thing. But like, uh, and this doesn't have to be a DTR, like a define the relationship. It could be, and sometimes it needs to be, but, um, like getting comfortable talking about our friendships is actually the only things that's going to give us the space to like, to continue and, and process moments of discomfort as opposed to, well, I experienced this discomfort and then I disengage. Um, and so like just getting comfortable talking about friendship instead of going like just getting to a point of discomfort and then disengaging is, is what helps us to, um, that's like one of the practices that we've been able to do. But, uh, and then like, sometimes it does kind of look like a, a DTR where we, uh, like we essentially, we need to define the relationship. Like, are we, are we like satisfied where our friendship is or like, does it need to be something different this season? It doesn't always need to be like, Hey, I want our friendship to be something more like, I want to see you more. I want to do this or that. Like, uh, sometimes it means like, Hey, I, uh, like, I love our friendship, but in this season, it needs to be something different. Like, um, and so it, it's not always the goal to be an upgrade in, in some way, but, um, like it creates the opportunity to, to one day be something else. And well, and it, it puts both people on the same page, right? Like it doesn't have to be like, Hey, our relationship needs to change, but it's like, Hey, I'm operating from a different place than you are. And maybe we need to like, one of us needs to move up or one of us needs to move down, or we just need to balance out because we just like, we need to be on the same page here. It's our, it's our yeah, no, there's, um. And like, again, this, this is going to look a lot different. Like a couple examples that we came up with are like, uh, hey, I love our friendship, but this is a really rough season uh, and I don't have the resources right now. Or maybe it's like, hey, I need an older person in my life. Can we get lunch in two weeks? Uh, or, hey, we've been spending time together every week and I, I don't want that to stop. And like, it gives us the space to actually engage our friendship and go, okay, like, what does it need to be in this season? And, and I like, that's been really good for both of us and it's gotten us to where we are now, so. Yeah, and I, like, I think it's important, again, like, it's not always an upgrade. Like, when uh, we were sitting in the car and he's going, I don't have room for that. I had to go, okay, then that's not where we're at. And I see a lot of us who are celibate and who are, like, committed to friendship, we have that conversation and we give up. And, it's, it, like, I know there's hurt. Like, I was so hurt and, like, left and cried. I think I cried in the car with you, but, like, left and cried. And, but I had to go, okay, well, is Nick worth, like, is friendship with Nick worth having Nick where he is? He can't be right now the person I wish he was. Is he, is he worth like where he's at? And like, I decided he was, and, and I also felt called to him and like, but I had to change some of my expectations. I had to change some of my investment, but getting on the same page is worth it. And it gives people room to be where they're at. And sometimes relationships grow and sometimes they don't. I mean, I've had friendships that go both ways, right? Where they get stronger or where they just fall off the wayside after that because people don't want to be on the same page. So how many, but I think we need to be able to have this. How many girlfriends has Nick had since all this has started? That kind of brings me to the next uh, practice. So the first practice was to, you know, get comfortable talking about our friendship. Uh, but the next and the reason why I ask is I don't think they're actually growing at all. I think they're just growing closer to each other, but they're not growing as individuals. So that's just my assessment of what's going on. This is to actually make room for who our friend is. And this one's really hard for me. We're, we're swapping weaknesses for a little bit. Um, I think it's hard for a lot of side B people because we talk a lot about friendship and we read a lot about friendship and we pray a lot about friendship and we see what scripture says about friendship. I mean, I, most of the verses I've memorized are about friendship. Um, and it, it becomes really easy to create these romanticized ideas of friendship. And if we're not careful, we do to friendship what other people do to romance. We idolize it and we expect it to fill all of our needs and to operate within our boundaries, right? I've had moments in friendship with Nick where I just get so frustrated with all the things that he's not. Like he's not intentional enough or not sensitive enough or not on time enough. Yeah, that's gotten better, thank the Lord. All right, he he needs time alone. And that is so frustrating to me. Like we'll be on vacation and Nick is like, like he'll Nick, Nick just turn to me and be like, you need to stop talking now. And I'm like, sorry that we're in California and I'm excited to talk to you about that beautiful rock, you know? No, but I don't. I could really easily just get upset with all the things he's not. This is someone who's putting friendship as an idol. Especially, he's using friendship as an idol, you know, to, like, save him from committing uh, um, sodomy, I guess, is the more proper way. But, you know, he's not actually using it to grow in his repentance. And I would totally miss out on the friend that I do have. You know, I start wishing Nick was more extroverted or more affectionate or more intentional. 
But that's loving a fake idea of my friend, not loving the friend I have. And, and at some point we have to stop dreaming about friendship and we have to love the person in front of us. And again, we create these ideals, right? We, we know what we want, but the only way to get someplace else is to love the person right in front of you. Otherwise we try to mold people. And I've experienced this before. We try to mold people in our image and not receiving them and the image of God that they're created in, right? There is so much about God's heart that is seen in who Nick is. And I like, I enjoy it so much now that I've let myself receive it. I've enjoyed so much of who God is through Nick. But for a while, I was kind of going, you need to be who God is through me. You need, you need to change. You need to be someone different. And I could not love the person in front of me. I have to make room for the person that he is. I need to recognize that he has needs and that like he needs to be alone sometimes. And I don't get it because I need to be alone almost never. You have to put a gun in my head and be like, go spend an hour alone. And I'll be like, fine, I guess. Or maybe I'd rather just get shot. I don't know. But he needs to process something alone sometimes before he's ready to talk to me about it. Don't get that either, right? Like that's hard for me, but I have to make room for that instead of just getting pouty about it or getting upset or taking offense and like drawing boundaries in the relationship. Like, okay, fine. I guess we're not as close as I thought, you know? Um, one of the main ways we practice this is by asking each other, hey, what do you need? You know, we, during the pandemic, before we lived together, we started spending every weekend together from like, we, we usually see each other Thursday to Friday, but we started going like Thursday to Saturday because we saw no other human beings and we're going insane. And that's a lot of time all that wants to be together. So on Thursday, I would call Nick and I would say, hey, I know we've got a lot of social time. Like we're going to be together for 36 hours. What do you need? And he would go, okay, well, I need like two hours where we don't talk. Or I need Friday afternoon. I need to go like, I need to go for a run. Or Friday afternoon, I'm going to go watch TV and leave me, leave me alone. And giving him that space then allows him to recharge, allows him to like attune to himself, take care of himself, and then continue to have like a great weekend with me, as opposed to like, if I'm fighting for what I need and he's fighting for what he needs, then what ends up, ends up happening is he goes, okay, if I'm with Art, I'm not going to be able to like get the rest I need or whatever, so I'm just going to leave at noon. But instead, we're able to spend more time together by giving him the space for what he needs, by checking in with like, and I might say, hey, I really need us to have a good conversation on Friday morning. You know, I need you to like have room for some emotional stuff that's on my plate. Um, and they'll step into that, right? Or I would say, I really need a hug a big hug. I know that's not your jam, but I really need a big hug. It's been the worst week and it's a pandemic and no, no other human being touched me. Hi, buddy. You know, so we, we start asking ourselves, like, what do you need? And I need to make room for him, but he also has to make room for me. And what I mentioned earlier about like attraction being a challenge, he's made room for conversations about sexuality. I'm sure he had never planned on having. And he's made room for conversations about my experience that I know neither of us would like, would, would have preferred us to have necessarily. You know, he's asking me questions at the cop shop. I'm like, we need to leave before we have this conversation, right? But one of the reasons my attractions aren't really that big of an issue anymore isn't because they're just totally gone, but it's because there's there's room for us to talk about it. I know that if like there comes a season where I'm having all sorts of romantic feelings, back in April, oh my gosh, he was the only human being I was seeing. And I had butterflies every time I saw him. And I'm like, oh no, I'm falling in love with him. And we have like a conversation about it. And I was all defensive and scared and he made room for it. And then I was almost instantly this better. Because, like, oh, I just needed to talk through this. But I know there's room in our friendship for the things I'm experiencing and for who I am. And he knows there's room for who he is. I think, uh, so the next one is creating space for the love. So, you know, what's basically going on here is they're basically having a sexless marriage. You know, just awkward to say, but, you know, all this stuff they're talking about are basically the challenges of a husband and wife moving in together. You know, they got to learn uh, who needs space and... You know, who needs more affection? Who needs more conversation? And that's what's going on here. They're basically living as a homosexual married couple without the sex. And that's what Revoice is promoting. They're trying to create a distinction between um, just the physical sexual acts that are that have so sexuality and they're trying to create this category of, you know, a same sex attracted Christian where a Christian is not in sin if they wrestle with these desires or they're not sinning if they're having these desires. They're only sinning if they um, stick their penis in someone's butt. And that's not a biblical notion at all. You know, sin does encompass our attitudes, desires, motivations, as well as our actions. So their solution to this is to create a friendship that's basically a, a marriage without sex. Light, but before I go into that, just like if you're if you're hearing this and going like Thursday to Saturday. How the heck do you have all the time for that? And like, we we are both single currently. And like, we do have different space than you might if you're if you're listening right now. And but he's going to be single for a very long time because no woman wants to get with this package deal. 
Now I don't know how he is about um, uh, transvestite women, like or transvestite males. Like maybe he Nick thinks that uh, a he can be a she, and I don't know whether that would be uh, that type of uh, situation would uh, placate both of them. But you know he, you know he's not setting himself up to uh, get married and start a family at all. He's actually doing quite the opposite he's uh using this relationship to remain a child but like what's really important is that like and we worded it this way specifically creating space for delight because like if that's not your situation that is totally fine like uh but being intentional about the space that you do have maybe that looks like uh like if you have kids and you have a celibate person in your life like in, invite your celibate friend to that kid's baseball game or whatever it is like creating space to do those things like to invite them into the mundane like those are the things that we get to do uh and it's it's really important so like you hear thursday to saturday or you hear create space for delight and like this like doing fun stuff together like how do you have time for that uh it's it's more about intentionality with the time that you do have than having more time or doing like uh doing a thursday to saturday or that sort of thing but um, so creating space for delight. This isn't just go and do fun stuff together. We totally do this. We Lord of the Rings card game. We play it a lot. It's a lot of fun. Uh, we love road trips and uh, like we have a running list of movies that I don't know if he's on here, but somebody's contributed. Uh, Ross, uh, Ross, you're our hero. We we watch a lot of Ross movies. We appreciate you, Ross Nair. So we have a running list that uh, that people have contributed to, and like a running list of movies that we will just go back to when we need it. Like that question, Hey, what do you need? Sometimes we just need a movie and creating space for delight means more important than just going and doing fun stuff together. Uh, putting down conflict or putting down heavy stuff and just going, we just need to enjoy each other. Like specifically in the context of our, our friendship, especially like when there, when there are harder seasons or things going on, like there's a sense of trust there that, that goes, yeah, we, we know there's stuff here. We know there's stuff going on. We'll get to it. But like, we need to also enjoy our friendship together and, and choose to do that and create that space to, to delight. So like you hear Lord of the Rings card game, like, uh, and like, I hope I have time for that, but like creating the time to do that and creating the space to do that is actually what makes not just these types of friendships, but friendship in general, like actually sustainable uh, in, instead of just picking up and going home when it's, when it's difficult. And so, um, yeah creating space for delight. And that, that's hard for me because I'm someone who like, if you let me, we'll have deep conversation until we die. Like we won't get up, we won't get up for water. We'll just start right here having deep conversation. And Nick sometimes just needs to go, dude, we just need to like have a, do a fun thing. Or I also need to resolve things. And we had just on Friday, right? Like Friday we had this big, fun, beautiful day plan to celebrate my birthday. But we had kind of a heavy conversation. We, we have Friday morning coffee every Friday. Um, and we had a really heavy conversation at Friday morning coffee and we didn't really settle our disagreement about it. And we just knew we wouldn't get to. He needed space to process alone. Like I needed to talk to my counselor, all these things. And I just was like, I do not want to go buy a fig tree with you now. You know, I don't want to like, do that. We, we did buy a fig tree. It's very cute. But like, I didn't want to go do that. Like that ruined the fun of it for me. But he said, there, he's like, listen, we are going to have unresolved conflict and we just need to go, we still need to be able to do fun things. And that's been really important for me. And he teaches me that so much to like, just still go enjoy each other. Like not everything needs to be fixed for the thing in front of you. So today. touching up on the whole marriage thing and how none of these uh, people are, none of these two individuals are actually really growing up and becoming men. They're just boys who can shave and... But a lot of times men use friendship as like an escapist mechanism. Like we use friends to get away from our troubles, away from our problems. And what we see here is that, you know, these guys are using friendship as an idol. And they're trying to put all their stock in this friendship. And it doesn't really sound like they're, you know, there's a whole lot of time for God in their own lives because they're just so focused on their own friendship. And... You know, it's not a healthy relationship. And that's that's hard for me because I'm like, until everything's fixed, this relationship is terrible. I'm very black and white. But like, sometimes there's things that are not great, but this thing right here, this thing is great. And I can just enjoy that, right? Like, it's still great to play a card game with him, even though we don't agree about like, what's happening we're going to buy for upstairs, which we don't. It's driving me crazy, right? Um, I don't know about the things at all, I promise. But getting creative about that, uh, finding like, what do you just enjoy? If you have just good coffee, good tea, we drink a lot of coffee and tea. Um, but getting creative about that and doing like mundane things, you know, like keep one board game on hand that you know you just enjoy. You know, make it a kid's board game because then it's not exhausting after a day of work, you know? And like getting little things on hand that you just like can bust out because you like them, you know? And uh, it's, it's been such a good for us. Uh, all right, our last practice that's helped us navigate friendship, I'll review them afterwards, don't worry. Uh, but our last pr uh, practice is to get on the same team, which is like very specific phrasage for us. And I'll try to explain it. It's a little like abstract of a concept, 
but it's been super important in our friendship. Um, I mean, you know, just as a societal af- uh, colloquialism, you know, if you're hitting for the wrong team is a code for being a homosexual, you know, and to then apply that metaphor of being on the same team, a little weird. One of the questions we got was, how do you handle conflict? And I would say that this principle has been the biggest game changer in how we engage conflict. I mean, like overnight, we saw a real difference in how we have conflict. We disagree a lot because we're really different. And I would say lately, we disagree way more than we fight. And it's largely because of this principle that we, we get on the same team. So what I mean is that with any conflict, any situation, any issue, we need to be on the same, same team. Um, I'm a little visual, so like, I like to think of it like this. It's easy to position yourself against each other in conflict, right? Me like putting my fists up and duking it out with Nick. Like I'm trying to take Nick down. But being on the same team means that it's me and Nick like on the same side against our conflict. If there's a disagreement, it's a barrier that we're both trying to take down by taking it up. I'm not trying to take him down. I'm trying to take this disagreement down. So we're together facing this problem, not us against each other, not me against Nick with this issue. You know, um, Nick and I both have some baggage that affects our friendship. Uh, if you want to know what his is, you can DM me later. I'll tell you everything. But mine is some insecurity that I wrestle with, right? And it's sometimes it makes me really defensive. It's like, it's just hard sometimes for me to believe someone loves me. And that's like, I can trust that. So I might see offense in something Nick did not mean, right? I might see like, oh, he doesn't want to spend time with me when that's really the opposite. And when that's happening, instead of Nick getting defensive or getting mad at me because I'm being like defensive or like flippant, he can step in and goes, okay, it's us against your defensiveness right now. We are both trying to dismantle your insecurity. We are both trying to make sure that you're safe because that's my defensiveness is making sure I'm safe. So instead of fighting my defensiveness, Nick goes, okay, well, I'm trying to make you safe too. And so he might do that by pausing in conflict and say, and like, he does this all the time. He's so good about it. He's a little less emotional than I am. So he's able to like pause when things are tense and remind me of some facts. Which is I really hope helpful. this isn't too but fast anyway, for you, you know, but team, and I love you. I'm trying to power through this. So you don't have to defend yourself right now. Or he might take a moment, recognize that I'm feeling insecure and just affirm me. Like, and, like typically Nick has not historically been a words of affirmation per- person, but now he goes, if I'm being defensive, he says, Hey, I really care about you. You contribute a lot to our friendship. It's totally normal that we're having this conflict. And I'm like, Oh, and he steps in and carries the weight of my defensiveness with me. And in the same way, we've had moments where he says something hurtful or possibly even homophobic. And in queer friends, if we have our own internalized homophobia, which almost every single one of us Critical has, theory. we have to know our straight friends are going to have some homophobia. So but remember, uh, queer theory is a branch of critical theory, and you can internalize, um, you know, just like a black person can internalize racism. You know, same thing here with uh, homosexuality. Just like a fact. And... It, while it's not our job to make them feel okay about that or to coddle them, Nick is someone I'm choosing to live life with. So rather than freaking out when he shows his ignorance or homophobia, I have to remind myself that I'm on his team. So we are together dismantling his homophobia. We are together dismantling any ignorance he has, any problematicness he has. And there's a lot to this and this can be really loaded. And let me be really clear. I'm not saying we go own everyone's homophobia or everyone's oppressive behavior. This does not work in cases of abuse or oppression. So I'm not saying, hey, if someone's abusing you, it's your job to fix that. Not at all. It is fully Nick's job to dismantle any homophobia within himself. But because I know he's he's proactive and humble and repentant and deeply committed to friendship with me, I want to help him dismantle that when it comes up. So when we're on vacation, and we'll probably talk about this in a second, but when we're on vacation, he says something homophobic and I go, hey, that was homophobic. I don't get to just get mad and shut down. I would love to, and sometimes it's hard not to. If he's a Christian, why does he take offense at that? He shouldn't take offense at that. Like, that is basically him identifying as a homosexual. And that's his priority in life. That's his identity. And obviously he puts his identity in this idol of a friendship that he's created. But he still identifies as a homosexual. And that's incompatible with a Christian life. And, you know, how many times have they talked about their own Christian life in this chat, which on a supposedly Christian conference? Not a lot. And... It's because that's not the main thing in their life. That's not the main thing in their friendship. Their friendship is basically a homosexual marriage without the sex. And then he's trying to like coach. He's trying to be the woke coach for Nick over here. You know, it's basically, you know, again, this is queer theory, which is under critical theory. So it's a, the cousin of critical race theory. And if we certainly, if the church succumbs to critical race theory, this will be next. But I try to go, this is, this is part of what we're doing together is we're dismantling each other's brokenness. It's us against this issue. We do not owe this to everyone. I certainly do not owe this to everyone. There are people in my life who are homophobic and I'm like, great, that's your problem. You can live in peace. But Nick has earned my benefit of a doubt. He's bled with me and he's cried with me and I can assume he's on my team. So I can, as his teammate, step into that and face that with him. So with everything, with every issue, with every trial, with every, like, if he's had a bad week, we get on the same team. If he needs something, right? If he needs to be alone and I don't understand that, we get on the same team. 
you know, if we're fighting about something, and this will happen, we'll start to like get like defensive or angry at each other because we're having a hard conversation, or like one of us will start to raise our voice, and then we'll both pause and we'll be like, we're on the same team. We don't need to fight each other. We're fighting this issue. We're not against each other. And we constantly remind each other of that. That's been so helpful. So in conflict, get on the same team. Like position yourself with your friends, not against them. And hopefully they're positioning themselves with you. Now, if, if consistently someone's not, right? And we can tell that, that's a different conversation. And again, define that relationship, maybe understand where things are going. But um, okay, so quick review. We've had uh, to get comfortable talking about our friendship, make room for who our friend is, make space for delay, and get on the same team. Um, so we're going to move to Q&A. We did have a few people email questions. So we wanted to talk through, I think, three of those. Yeah, three of those. Um, I know some of y'all emailed more. Sorry, we picked a few. Uh, and then we can get into other Q and A that's like live, and we would love to talk about anything y'all want to talk about. Um, so, uh, Nick, I think the first question is for you. So, the first question: uh, Does Nick have any advice for other queer people on how we might best approach building this kind of life with our straight friends? Yeah, and this one came in advance, so I was able to get some a little bit more thought. But um... all right, so now we're getting into more of their instruction for you know the people who would attend a Revoice conference. So this is their Q and A. The one thing that stuck out to me a lot was that, um, like, so I talked about how, like, this is, this is not just like Nick walking with art in his celibacy and like coming in and, and like, uh, being helpful for him in that. But like, I really believe that this is God's best for both of us. And so like, uh, one piece of advice that, that I would give in, in answer to that question is like, assume that your straight friend actually needs you as much as, uh, as much as you think you need them. Because like, there's so many times that like, I, like, I need art in my life and like, I'm so much better of a person because art is in my life. And I really believe that my marriage is going to be so much better. Like not just like an added bonus, no, but I really think that my marriage, that my marriage is going to be so much better because art is going, yo, you gotta, you gotta like stop. I said, no woman is going to want that package deal. No woman's going to want to be compared to, uh, her husband's best friend, the entire marriage. Hasn't anyone seen the show scrubs? You know, the whole JD and Turk dynamic, you know, caused a lot of problems in Turk's marriage. Why? Because this type of dynamic, but that was a heterosexual friendship. But that's that that was the joke though. That was the joke of what they were making fun of was that their friendship was so intense it was uncomfortable for one of their marriages. Stop with that. Like or like that's so like all I have to say, assume that your straight friend needs you like so much and just as much if not maybe even more than uh than you think you need them i told him the other day that when he gets married i'm gonna hand his wife a bill for i think he said seventy thousand yeah. dollars for all the emotional labor i've done to prepare him for a great committed relationship and he knows how to talk about his feelings Probably he knows how, coffee. yeah i mean he knows how to sit down and like figure things out about a house he knows how to decorate like his wife owes me money and i'm gonna get paid um and so. she's gonna bill him for the eventual divorce and counseling but like i think the other thing with how we can approach our friends this is, I'm going to speak to our queer friends right now. Hi guys. Um, we cannot become self-absorbed because of our pain. And this is just speaking honestly, like this is hard for me. And I had a season of like being so fearful of celibacy that I was going, what do I need for my friends? What do I need for my friends? And then at one point I realized I had totally neglected what my friends needed from me. And I think if we want to build a full life with our friends, we have to be invested in what they need. Like we have to be on their team and we have to show them that because if we're just going, here are my needs because I'm going to be celibate. And it's your job to figure that out with me because of the Bible and church. Like, that's not how that works, right? So we're stepping in together and I have to be careful to not become self-absorbed. I think it's definitely happened with Tommy where like my friend Tommy and Michelle, I've totally underappreciated them at times because of just like feeling so fearful and going, oh, well, they have each other because they're married. That is not a mindset I ever want to support in other people, but I think it. I go, Tommy doesn't mean he's got a wife, but I need to step in with him. Um, so I think that's the one thing. And the other thing I would say, so again, the question is um, how queer people might best approach building this kind of life with our straight friends. Uh, start sharing your actual needs. Like I think sometimes we pretend like we're fine. It was my pain that caused Nick to step in. And I think sometimes our community does not step in because they don't see what it costs us. And we think, oh, well, they wouldn't care. And if I had three years ago told Nick, like, hey, we're going to be basically friend married one day, he would have been like, probably not. But the more and more he felt like there was needs in my life that God was calling him to meet because he's my brother, the more we look at ourselves and go, oh, this is a lot longer term than we thought it was. And so start sharing your actual needs. Um, the next question is a hard one. I also edit it a little bit because of swearing. Um, if there are ways that you leverage marginalized identities to justify crappy behavior, how does Nick confront the behavior without invalidating the marginalization you experience? I'm going to reword that because it is a mouthful. But if there are ways I try to justify bad behavior on my part because I am queer and there's pain, how does Nick confront the behavior that is hurtful without invalidating my pain? Super valid this year because it's 2020 and I'm an immigrant and I'm gay and I work for a church and COVID and just like so many other things. So there was a lot of pain in my life. And I'll be really honest. Um, when the protests first started happening, Ooh, ago, critical I, race theory. I really had to prepare myself to see Nick that weekend because he's a straight white guy, which I'm going to call it out is not fair because like Nick is not 
like Nick does not hurt me in ways that other like straight white people have hurt me. And Nick has not shown racism towards me in the ways other people in like churches and other, but like there was this part of me that like just threw that on him because first of all, I was seeing no one else because COVID, but also there was like so much pain and so much confusion. And it was really hard to just trust well, I was him. in pain. And I was really honest with him about that. Um, but also I think still like there was anger that showed up. There was ways I lashed out. And I think the relationship we've had, he's- This guy's in a cult of Marxism. And it just bleeds over, you know. It's not just a queer theory that he embraces; it's critical race theory he embraces. I have to help me out here, but like, we are on the same team, <laughs> and that's when we go, "Hey, we're on the same team." So, like, you, you, he, the way he says it, it's like you're shooting yourself in the foot because we're one body. So, don't lash out at me to try to fix this because you're hurting yourself. And that's been really helpful. Um, the biggest thing for like, like I need to own that with you. Like, I, like I need to. If I'm laying my life down for my friend, and if I'm, if I'm, go, if I'm really saying like one. I want to walk through this like with you and like specifically i want to do that in a way that like we're on the same team then even in those moments like that's a moment that i need to go we're on the same team here and like that that is difficult for me it's really difficult to like lay down my pride in that moment and say like well i didn't do that like that kind of thing but like i'm walking that with you and like we get to do that together and we're on the same team in it and, and he totally like he'll say man like that like i'm with you so that's like i, I feel your fear and i feel your hurt and like I have to remind myself of that, that he's there carrying that burden with me, and he could totally get defensive. He had like there's been moments where he had every right to like start defending himself because I was like lashing out, and he'll, well, he'll like stop me, but came in like you're saying some things that are hurtful to me. I would much rather you just let me carry all that pain with you. And like that's, well, I mean, what do you say to that, right? Like you know you've just been a jerk, and he's going, well, I'd like to carry your pain with you, and like then I have to just shut up because it's a good guy. Um, and uh, question number three. Would love to hear how you talk with Nick about moments. He, oh boy! Uh, would love to hear how you talk with Nick about moments he thinks he's arrived at allyship when that is not the case. Oh my god! Okay, so this has happened before. Uh. Where Nick has totally like been like, I'm the best friend ever, and I've also been like, I'm the best friend ever because homophobia will make you. Oh sorry, he's the best friend ever. Homophobia will make you put the bar really low, and so and I've totally done this where anything anyone does nice for me, I'm go, oh well, they keep me around and they're so good to me, and like Nick doesn't kick me out of his life right. for being attracted to him. After that, he owes me nothing. You know, that's not the case. And so I've allowed people, first of all, to feel like they've allowed an allyship because they are not actively horrible against me. And that's not the case. So Elmo's because we spend so much time together, that ends up becoming an issue because I need him to be more than just I don't just know if you've seen that on Louder with Crowder. Elmo's an ally. Because he's horrible to me. So we went on this road trip to Kentucky. Oh, and he said something that was like not like against me, but it was kind of homophobic. And there was a homophobia in the statement. And I said, hey, that was kind of homophobic. And instantly he tensed up and was like, I can't believe you would call me homophobic. After like everything I do, you know, I support you, you know, I've got your back. Like we're talking about living together, like how, and there was like defensiveness. You and, can never be woke like, enough. What I point out with him is, and I said it earlier, I have internalized homophobia. I do. I have to struggle to not hate other gay people and myself. Of course you do. You can't tell me that I, a gay man, am more homophobic than you are, you know, like, or, or am more exposed to homophobia than you are. So you have to at least like be open to the fact that there is homophobia you have to work through. You have to be open to the, the thought that there is a lot you still have to learn. And, and I think that assumption that like, this one it specifically says like there are moments where i feel like i've arrived at allyship but like it is just because there are moments where i where i am an ally to you does not mean that i've arrived and then i can you can, can never be woken up there's never an like, end uh, like, to this I need, just because i do work space salvation that, of this moments, false like, religion I that. like in that moment i was being homophobic to you and or to whatever the situation was like i i need to go okay just because i do it sometimes doesn't mean i always do it or i always get it right and i need to like similar to asking myself why am i uncomfortable in this moment i need to ask myself okay in this moment what like what is what is he experiencing what am i doing that is uh like that that's happening so yeah also i think this is just true about any conflict between the two of us uh as much as you can make it about the behavior and not like identity so like saying hey that thing and that's i had to clarify that thing you just did was homophobic i'm not saying you were totally homophobic but that thing you did that was like there was homophobia in it and if so he's I, a christian why does he care to be able to address behavior individualized, right? To say like this one thing, and there's probably, there might be other things. And when those other things come up, I'm gonna say that one thing too. Or if there's a list of things, then, you know, hey, there's a few things. Maybe don't pummel them with a list all at once. Um, we would love to take more questions. I did see one question that's just a simple yes. So there was a question, is this a lifelong commitment? Yeah, right? Unless I don't know something. Yeah, no, it's lifelong. Um, so he stuck with me. I like that. All right. I'm uh, blink twice if you're in trouble, Nick. Choppiness. Um, I think probably I, I, what I perceive as the word choppiness is maybe like that discomfort um, or like the uh, like there's almost like a dissonance between uh, like that relationship or whatever it is. But like, uh, yeah, I, I totally have experienced that with specifically with my biological family. Like, uh, like they can be pretty homophobic sometimes. And there are moments where I need to like, like it would be so easy for me to 
if, if he's not there in that moment, like I could just, well, they're not there or whatever, but like, and it, like, it could be easier for me to go, yeah, it's five of them against me or like, and I could easily just be silent in this moment and, and it would, everything would just go according to a plan. But like, uh, there's, those are moments that I need to go, like, if I really believe that this is, this is good. And like, if I really believe that this is good for both of us, then like, I need to stand up and like speak up in this moment, even when it's easier not to. Um, but like that internal conflict of like, is it like, it's easier to be silent about that or whatever, but like, um, I don't know. Yeah. I think like, it kind of reminds me of that that first uh, challenge that I mentioned of like continually going back to the question like why am I uncomfortable in this moment or why am I experiencing this discomfort or choppiness and then uh, like if that's homophobia like or if that's perception stuff like I need to lay that down and uh, like yeah I had dinner I'm just trying to quick sorry I had dinner with his family for his birthday recently and I don't spend too much time with them um, just because like logistics but uh, I was kind of going hey should I like straighten up a little bit maybe like not wear a pride shirt or not be super queer and he texted back uh, if there's anything uncomfortable for them that's theirs to own and i'll deal with that you're like you're gonna come and be yourself so i, I super appreciated that and felt like very affirmed and safe nick's um, family yeah, so probably thinks he's gay um we've had a couple of people ask about your outside accountability beyond just your relationship i know that you've mentioned that you have this group of guys that you've been friends with um for years and years what does your accountability look like outside of your friendship with one another and just relationships in general like not just accountability but accountability to what and for what um okay so i'm more social just naturally so i've i have more friends than he does um and it's it's not for likability because every time we go on vacation i'm reminded that he's actually a little more likable than i am sometimes but um i just naturally gravitate towards having a lot of friends and one of the things for me for my own health i make sure i have a network to rely on um and so like if i'm ever largely leaning on one person i try to disperse that not because of lack of trust but just like no one person can do everything um and so we have our, our two brothers from college so we have like there's four of us who are really good friends in college we're still extremely good friends we play Dungeons and dragons every two weeks um we just saw them for my birthday and we'll, i'll probably see them this weekend so they live an hour away so they live a little further um but we still are very intentional with them one of them lived in uh, illinois for two years and we still i mean i had a standing thursday appointment with him on zoom on skype before we knew what zoom was and uh you know the other one i make sure to babysit his girls so that his he and his wife can go on dates you know things like that um so i try really hard to make sure we have other relationships um my pastor and i are really close which i know so many people can't say that and that breaks my heart and my pastor's one of my dearest friends and his whole family like his, like i the joke is that if I'm having a bad day, I go cry on their couch. It's not a joke. It's just a fact. But um, like he and his wife are like a big listening ear for me. And so I have like several other relationships. My chosen family consists of um, Nick and five other guys, just, like brothers. Um, and then like a few other people who are in there as like just family members. And so a lot of them are really mature believers. And we talk a lot about my relationship with Nick and about pretty much every area of my life. Celibacy. My pastor has helped me figure out celibacy a lot. Um, you want to tell them about the, like the conversation we had with Jeff? Yeah. So my pastor's name is Jeff. And uh, Nick and I have essentially gone to like uh, friendship premarital counseling with Jeff. Um, like I said, but, like, didn't we, I say that they treat their friendship as basically a marriage, a gay marriage without the sex? And we just started there realizing like go. there's dynamics of our friendship that we just figure out alone. So we, we over the past year and a half, especially, we've been more intentional about including our community in those conversations. So we scheduled a meeting with my pastor, and we also scheduled a meeting with our, our other two best friends, just to be like, hey, speak into this a little bit. Like, I mean, they have the right to anyway, right? And I talk to them all the time, um, but we had never just said, tell us, is there anything we don't see? But so we went and talked to my pastor and we're like, you know, is there something we don't see? Um, I was, we were kind of going, yeah. you're married. It has amazing marriage, amazing kids. Is this not going to work with a marriage? You know, are we asking a lot of his wife? And like, one of the things he said was, because we asked like, Jeff, is this going to work? And he said, it will, it is as nobody's asked as it possible. And he said, it is as possible as you are committed to it. And that was so helpful. Um, I've also had days where I'm like having conflict with Nick and my pastor comes into the, like I work with him. So I'm like, hey, what's going on? And I, I asked him like, hey, how do you navigate conflict with, you know, your wife? Because that's who he lives with. Um, and that's been super helpful because one day he was like, you're never going to stop forgiving Nick, so get over it. And I was like, oh, cool. I think, so the biggest thing for me, and like, I mentioned how, like, it, like that, that grinds at me because I'm like, ah, like if we're talking about it, it, it we're try like, like us going and, and talking with his pastor, like that makes, like that makes me feel like, oh, we're trying to, or like, we're like that, that eats at me. But like, I, so I still need to get comfortable talking about our friendship in different ways. And like, yeah. like it is so much easier to, to go, okay, like if we're doing this, it's, it's weird or, oh, it's like, we should not be doing this, but like these are the things that help like there's really no uh, blueprint for exactly what we're doing so like we need to bring people alongside us that like we trust and we believe are seeking god's heart uh, for themselves and for their families and, and also for us as we ask them to have this conversation with us because like that's what like we both really believe this is god's best for the both of us yeah and so like asking people to to come into that and, and shed light on that is like something we need to do even if i'm uncomfortable with it or like yeah. So part of the work of our friendship is to encourage each other about other friendships. So like I'll sometimes say you need to talk to one of the other guys about this because like sometimes I need him to process something else. Like there was a conversation where some of his homophobia was coming up. I was like, I need you to go talk to the guys because I'm gonna slap you. Um, but uh, I would never, I have never. Um yeah. and let the record show. Yeah. Uh but also just like I don't want him to only rely on me. That's a bad dynamic. That's so toxic always. And so he'll be like, Hey, have you talked to Dan lately? And I'm like, Oh, I haven't talked to Dan lately. I should probably do that. 
That's good stuff. I like that. Um, this one is for art. It says how it's kind of a multi-part question. How do I rid myself of romantic feelings for my best friend who is straight? Um, what did that look like specifically for you? Um, she says, I delight in our friendship and don't feel comfortable coming out to her yet. The struggle and shame is so strong and I don't know what to do. Do you have any words of wisdom? I think this is one that probably any of us that are honest with ourselves, we've had to face at some point in time. So what, what's some advice you give to help to help handle that um, romantic attraction that comes? Um, first of all, I just want to say that you're not you're not a liability to that friendship, that you are a blessing and a gift. I often treat my queerness as a liability to like myself and to everything around me. More and more I've watched God um, so use my my surrender and my meeting of Jesus in every area of my life, including my queerness, as a gift to others. Uh, it's totally blessed our friendship. I mean, so much. Um, so you are not a liability. And his sin has blessed. So blessed to have you in or his sin has been blessed by God, is basically what he's arguing there. Passions and are wired differently. It's so beautiful. But that said, um, I'm not rid of my romantic feelings. I mean, you're not here right now. Uh, also, romance is a social construct, as a lot of sudden people love to say. Uh, there's hardly here. But, um, like, there's elements, of, I would say that there's like a Venn diagram, and there's areas where, like, romance overlaps into our friendship. We, we buy each other Valentine's, I guess, you know? Um, what? And, like, he, he, he beat me last year. Like, sometimes he's better than I am at stuff like that, uh, which is embarrassing. I'm a two. Oh, You've gotten really good. You did not used to be. Sure. Uh, but he's become, wow. I got a picture for my birthday. Come on. Um, but, uh, Wait, I got a pause. I, I was not prepared for that one. They buy each other Valentine's Day gifts. Wow. I was not prepared. I, I've compared this to a, to a marriage, a gay marriage without the sex, the entire time. And then he says, we buy each other Valentine's Day gifts. And I'm shocked. I, In the famous words of white women, I can't even... There are moments where I... I like have like butterflies or whatever, right? And I've had to learn that like that's going to be an ebb and flow. Like in some seasons that'll be really strong, in some seasons not so much. Um, using brother language is very helpful for a relationship. First of all, it's really helpful to contextualize it to other people because like we both work in ministry, so like people thinking we're dating is not an option. Um, but it is like we consider each other brothers. We're extremely close brothers, right? We live together, but like he's my family, and so using brother language helps me because it's like oh, I'm like categorizing this as a family member, and it is really reflective of that. But sometimes I do have romantic feelings for him, and I've had to also realize that like. It's not as black and white as we think. So like, you're allowed to just really like being really close with your friend. And some of those things that we think are like romantic feelings are just like intimacy. Like intimacy does not mean romance. And intimacy touches on friendship and romance. But like a lot of times we feel intimacy and we jump to romance. And like, I mean, I hope it's okay that I say, Nick's had moments where he questioned his sexuality because he was feeling like intimacy towards me. And he was like, am I gay? He's not gay, right? Um, sorry guys, but- uh, it, uh, You know, Forrest Gump once said, stupid is as stupid does. I think there there's some application with this. You know, but like we've had to like talk through that because he was freaking out. I'm like, dude, you're just you just feel close to someone, breathe. Like, but you know, poor straight boys, they're not taught that they can be close to someone and like that's automatically romantic. So first of all, like there's so much room for so much of the intimacy you feel, because probably less of it is like romantic than you actually think. Um, at least in my life that's the case. But then sometimes it is kind of like romantic. And it's helpful to remind myself that we are a family unit and there's a million ways to be close. Um I have not rid myself of all those romantic feelings. I'm sure there's gonna come a wave where it's gonna be stronger and a little, like a little harder. And what's really helpful again is having other relationships um, because some of that like romantic intensity is actually just like hyper-focusing on one person. Um, and so a lot of times when I'm feeling that, that's when I like lean into my other friends too, because I'm reminded, oh, my other friends are also beautiful and wonderful and I don't have to like throw all this intensity at this one person. I know that's not exactly what I was asked. I hope that's helpful. Oh, that, that's great. I hope that is helpful. I think that's, that was one of the um, greatest observations I ever had a counselor make was when I was trying to sort through that similar question and she responded well of course you're attracted to your friends why would you want to be with people that you're not interested in spending time with and that was um no do you want to go first or yeah I think well so for me like that kills me because I'm such a routines person that it, like totally throws me off but I think in its healthiest I think we go like it's that question what do you need this weekend or, like what do you need um it, it makes us go it's it's not so much about like we we need to have this specific rhythm like i we have Friday morning coffee and when Friday morning coffee gets taken away because we have a retreat or like there's a youth retreat I need to go on or something like that. We just like, it's a matter of going, okay, we know the values that we have in our friendship. We know that we, we care about making space for delight or we know we care. about. I don't like, think it can be said enough. And I haven't made the point because I wasn't sure whether he was in ministry, but these people should not be in ministry whatsoever, whatsoever. I would not trust either of them with youth ministry. Uh, being on the same team or we know we care about like some of these other practices we share like it's almost like a core values thing in our friendship and then okay how do we still accomplish those things right. in the midst of the season that we're in yeah I, that's a big thing for me is like if I get really caught up on the actual rhythm or practice it becomes like an, an idol but then I, sometimes I get that what do we get from that so like 
oh, well, I really need someone to talk to you about like the bad week I had. Okay, well, we can't do Friday night coffee, but can we can we talk Sunday night, you know, or can we do a phone call, which is not ideal in so many ways, but like is better, you know? Um, and I don't know that we've had, well, yeah, I know we've had seasons because of like work, like we often go like a whole July without seeing each other. Now that we live together, we won't, but like, because we're both youth workers, July is like travel week for youth pastors. And so we've totally gone July without like barely any contact. And um, sometimes we're intentional about seeing each other on the front end. And then as soon as we can, um, but also just like knowing going into it doesn't have to be like that. A, a big thing for me again is having the conversation. So like, did it get disrupted because we're not really trying or because we just like let it go? Or did it get disrupted because life is where it is right now and that's okay. So let's find a new rhythm. Um, our friend Jack, when he went to Illinois, like I didn't talk to him for the first few months and I called him like, this is not an option. So we set up a weekly Thursday morning phone call and sometimes we'd forget and like, we'd both it'd be like 11 o'clock and be like, oh, we didn't call each other. But largely it kept us in connection. So the goal is connection, right? It doesn't have to be that rhythm, but the goal is connection. Those goals only like talking about your friendship is what makes you like establish those values and then when those things do come up in life you say okay what's the value and then like we, we just go from there oh, that's great but set for each other do you have other role models for this kind of friendship other role models you go first? i think you're asking me that because you want me to go first no i'm just asking if you want to go first no okay um okay so first of all we don't, we don't have other role models and like but to be honest i've stopped asking i know no one who has the quality of friendships that i aspire to have so I've embraced that we're going to be pioneers and let's just go. Like not even this relationship, just like in general friendships, right? Like most adult men don't have friends and most pastors especially don't have friends. I refuse to be a pastor without friends. So I just, I'm going to do it. Um, but that said, uh, it's kind of been helpful to talk to people about their spouses. We're not romantic, we're not married, but we are like in some ways committed to each other for a really long term in ways that like there's like aspects of that, right? Like what does it look like to live with someone for the rest of your life? That's like, there are people in my life who have healthy marriages and there's things I can get from that. Talking to my pastor about how he handles conflict with his wife is really helpful even though Nick's not my husband or my spouse in any way, like it's helpful to navigate who, who's been in relationships that they've had for their whole life. Yeah. Largely those relationships are romantic for people. So then I get what I can from that. Um, how to figure out what we can expect from each other. I mean, we talk a lot. Um, is, that, is that the first question? Sorry. Can you yeah. How do you figure out what expectations to set for each other? Yeah. Um, we've had to talk about like, and we, this was a conversation we had with our friends. What were the, what were the expectations we have for all of our brothers? So the four of us, and we came up with like a really good, this was really helpful. It was a great conversation. And then what are the expectations that are a little more like in our relationship, just because um, we live together, we're planning on living together for the long haul, things like that. Um, those expectations will probably shift and they definitely shift seasonally, but it's like sitting down and talking. Um, one of my big things again is that like, I should expect my needs to be met by a, a, a wide network and a strong community. And so there are some things I can lean on Nick on uniquely, but largely I'm going to try to, there's, I don't think there's much that I lean on Nick, like only on Nick for, I would say almost nothing. Um, because so I mean, the Bible talks about how it's not good for man to be alone. I mean, when you look at the creation account, that is the only time God says that something is not good after saying everything else is good, is that it's not good for man to be alone. And so he created Eve to be Adam's wife. And what you see here is that art recognizes that it's not good to be alone. It's not good to be alone. You know, that's in the Bible. And, you know, obviously I don't think he's a Christian, but... You know, that's general revelation is that it's not good to be alone. And he's trying to fulfill that need for a spouse with friendships. And it's creating very unhealthy friendships. Like you're not supposed to live with your friends all of your life like you're in some sort of sitcom. That's not how friendship is designed to work. That's not a biblical notion of friendship at all. So, and it's really holding uh, Nick here back because then he's not going to be able to, he's going to be using Art here as his wife in that sort of way, in the way that it's not good to be alone. So they're both basically perverting God's creative order in a different way than they think, or than he otherwise would be if he were not celibate. Process something with him first. I'm probably going to still talk to someone else about it and my other brothers. That's really important. I cultivate my trust with other people really strongly. Um, so I don't have to put all that on him. If he's having a busy week, I have someone else to talk to too. Like, that's just okay. Um, I think, like... I mean, again, it comes up the talking about like talking about our friendship and going, okay, what are the expectations or, or things like that? But also like, if there's not a specific role model, I think like both of us in that moment, we're like, do you have role models for this? We're like, well, we've talked about the fact that it's like what we're going for, like, though we do believe it's like God's best for both of us, it like for him and celibacy and for me and the possibility of marriage or whatever that looks like for me, like if we believe that's God's best, but we don't really know exactly what that looks like or have specific role models for that, like what are the elements about our, our friendship that we have talked about because we talk about our friendship 
that that we want to be consistent uh that we've wrestled through with other people in our community like like whether it was our conversation with jeff or tommy or jack but like so what are those things and then those elements like how maybe it's not this specific like one role model but like different elements from different relationships that we get to look at from our other brothers or jeff or other things like that yeah our role models are sam wise and frodo baggins also, yes. <laughs> uh, but also one last thing counseling like if I didn't have a counselor, I probably would have murdered Nick already. Like, like counseling is so helpful to figure out, like to have someone outside that I talk to about pretty much every aspect of our relationship. And he goes, hey, maybe don't put all that on him, you know, or maybe you need to process this in other ways. Um, and so counseling really highly recommend if you're trying to figure out boundaries with anyone. Yeah, that's great. Um, guys, thank you so much. Revoice family, thank you for- So, you know, that's what Revoice promotes. You know, this is on their channel. And you look, you know, the comments obviously uh, recognize that this is not the fruit of a regenerate soul. Like neither of these two are regenerate. They're not living in a way that's biblical. They're basically replacing uh, having a wife with having a best friend. They've elevated friendship to a marriage level. They have elevated that friendship to an idol status as well, I would argue. And that's why you heard a lot more about friendship than you heard about God. And it's, and the reason why that they don't have a role model for what they're doing is because there isn't one, as they said, there isn't a role model for what they're doing. They can't really look to scripture to justify what they're doing. And then you see that he's, you know, he still clings to homosexuality and he's perfectly okay with that and then still being in a ministry position, which neither one of those men or boys who can shave, I should say, should be in ministry. That's just, that's not something that should happen because they are grossly unqualified. So I just wanted to wrap up. Revoice, obviously this is the type of thing that they push that, you know, how gay can you be? without um and still be a christian how gay can you be and not be sinning is basically the point of revoice is they want to test the boundaries they want to play with sin and that's not a biblical attitude towards sin they want to treat sin like this cross to bear and that's not what sin is sin is not a cross to bear sin is something you drop and turn away from, and then you pick up your cross and follow Jesus. That's, you know, the cross that you pick up, the cross that you bear is not your sin. Jesus bore the cross for your sin. You don't bear your, you don't bear the cross for your sin. So my name's Ray. This is the Evangelical Dark Web. I am mentally worn out from this. Comment, let me know how long you lasted, and... Subscribe for more content like this that you know, does deeper dives on discernment. If you're a Presbyterian, I hope you appreciate the fact that you know I'm trying to help you out here. And I will catch you on the next one.